Section 30 of the Underground Railroad, Part 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kevin Davidson. The Underground Railroad, Part 2, by William Still, Section 30. Sundry Arrivals, Part 1. From Loudoun County, Virginia, Norfolk, Baltimore, Maryland, Petersburg, Virginia, etc., about the month of June, 1855. Arrival first, David Bennett and family. Arrival second, Henry Washington, alias Anthony Handley, and Henry Stewart. Arrival third, William Nelson and wife, William Thomas, Louisa Bell, and Elias Jasper. Arrival fourth, Maria Joyner. The first arrival to be here noticed consisted of David Bennett and his wife Martha with their two children, a little boy named George and a nameless babe one month old. This family journeyed from Loudoun County, Virginia. David, the husband, had been in bonds under Captain James Taylor. Martha, the wife, and her two children were owned by George Carter. Martha's master was represented as a very barbarous and cruel man to the slaves. He made a common practice of flogging females when stripped naked. This was the emphatic testimony of Martha. Martha declared that she had been so stripped and flogged by him after her marriage. The story of this interesting young mother, who was about twenty-seven years of age, was painful to the ear, particularly as the earnestness and intelligence of this poor, bruised, and mangled soul bore such strong evidence to the truthfulness of her statements. During the painful interview, the mind would involuntarily picture this demon, only as a representative of thousands in the South, using the same relentless sway over men and women, and this fleeing victim and her little ones, before escaping, only as sharers of a common lot with many other mothers and children, whose backs were daily subjected to the lash. If on such an occasion it was hard to find fitting words of sympathy or adequate expressions of indignation, the pleasure of being permitted to give aid and comfort to such was in part a compensation and a relief. David, the husband of this woman, was about thirty-two years of age. No further notice was made of him. Arrival number two consisted of Henry Washington, alias Anthony Hanley, and Henry Stewart, Henry left Norfolk, and a very mild master, known by the name of Seth March, out of sheer disgust for the patriarchal institution. Directly after speaking of his master in such flattering terms, he qualified the mild, etc., by adding that he was excessively close in money matters. In proof of this assertion, Henry declared that out of his hire he was only allowed one dollar and fifty cent per week to pay his board clothe himself and defray all other expenses, leaving no room whatever for him to provide for his wife. It was, therefore, an ever-failing source of unhappiness to be thus debarred, and it was wholly on this account that he took out, as he did, and at the time that he did. His wife's name was Sally. She, too, was a slave, but had not been treated roughly. For fifty long years Henry had been in the grasp of this merciless system constrained to toil for the happiness of others, to make them comfortable, rich, indolent, and tyrannical. To say that he was like a bird out of a cage conveys in no sense whatever the slightest idea of his delight in escaping from the prison house, and yet his pleasure was sadly marred by the reflection that his bosom companion was still in bondage in the gloomy prison house. Henry was a man of dark color, well made, and of a reflective turn of mind. On arriving in Canada, he manifested his gratitude through Rev. H. Wilson as follows. St. Catherine's, August twentieth, 1855. Dear Brother Still, I am requested by Henry Washington to inform you that he got through safe and is here in good business. He returns to you his sincere thanks for your attention to him on his way. I had the pleasure of receiving seven fugitives last week. Send them on, and may God speed them in their flight. I would like to have a miracle-working power, 
that I could give wings to them all so that they could come faster than by railroads, either underground or above. Yours truly, Hiram Wilson. While he was thus hopefully succeeding in Canada, separated from his companion by many hundreds of miles, death came and liberated her from the yoke, as a subjoined letter indicates. St. Catharines, C.W., November 12, 1855. Mr. William Still, Dear Sir, I have received a letter from Joseph G. Selden, a friend in Norfolk, Virginia, informing me of the death of my wife, who deceased since I saw you here. He also informs me that my clothing will be forwarded to you by Jupiter White, who now has it in his charge. You will therefore do me a great favor if you will be so good as to forward them to me at this place, St. Catherine, C.W. The accompanying letter is the one received from Mr. Selden, which I send you, that you may see that it is all right. You will please give my respects to Mrs. Still and family. Most respectfully yours, Henry Washington. Henry Stewart, who accompanied the above-mentioned traveler to Canada, had fled a short while before from Plymouth, North Carolina. James Monroe Woodhouse, a farmer, claimed Stewart as his property and hired him out for $180 per annum. As a master, Woodhouse was considered to be of the moderate type, according to Stewart's judgment, but respecting money matters, when his slaves wanted a trifle, he was very hard. He did not flog, but would not give a slave a cent of money upon any consideration. It was by procuring a pass to Norfolk that Henry managed to escape. Although a father and a husband, having a wife, Martha, and two children, Mary Ann and Susan Jane, he felt that his lot as a slave utterly debarred him from discharging his duty to them, that he could exercise no rights or privileges whatever, save as he might obtain permission from his master. In the matter of separation, even although the ties of husband and wife, parents and children were most closely knit, his reason dictated that he would be justified in freeing himself if possible. Indeed, he could not endure the pressure of slavery any longer. Although only twenty-three years of age, the burdens that he had been called upon to bear made his naturally intelligent mind chafe to an unusual degree, especially when reflecting upon a continued life of slavery. When the time decided upon for his flight arrived, he said nothing to his wife on the subject, but secured his pass and took his departure from Norfolk. On arriving there he sought out an underground railroad captain and arranged with him to bring him to Philadelphia. Whether the sorrow-stricken wife ever afterwards heard of her husband or the father of his two little children, the writer is unable to say, it is possible that this narrative may reveal to the mother and her offspring, if they are still living, the first ray of light concerning the missing one. Indeed, it is not unreasonable to suppose that thousands of anxious wives, husbands, and children who have been scattered in every direction by slavery will never be able to learn as much of their lost ones as is contained in this brief account of Henry Stewart. Arrival number three brought William Nelson, his wife Susan, and son, William Thomas, together with Louisa Bell and Elias Jasper. These travelers availed themselves of the schooner of Captain B., who allowed them to embark at Norfolk, despite the search laws of Virginia. It hardly need be said, however, that it was no trifling matter in those days to evade the law. Captains and captives, in order to succeed, found that it required more than ordinary intelligence and courage, shrewdness and determination, and at the same time a very ardent appreciation of liberty, without which there could be no success. The simple announcement, then, that a party of this number had arrived from Norfolk, or Richmond, or Petersburg, gave the committee unusual satisfaction. It made them quite sure that there was pluck and brain somewhere. These individuals, in a particularly marked degree, possessed the qualities that greatly encouraged the efforts of the committee. William Nelson was a man of a dark chestnut color, medium size, with more than an ordinary degree of what might be termed mother wit. Apparently William possessed well-settled convictions touching the questions of morals and religion, 
despite the overflowing tide of corruption and spurious religious teaching consequent on the existing pro-slavery usage all around him. He was a member of the Methodist Church, and under the charge of the Reverend Mr. Jones. For twenty years William had served in the capacity of a packer under Messrs. Turner and White, who held a deed for William as their legal property. While he declared that he had been very tightly worked, he nevertheless admitted that he had been dealt with in a mild manner in some respects. For his board and clothing, William had been allowed one dollar and fifty cents per week, truly a small sum for a hard-working man with a family, yet this was far more than many slaves received from their masters. In view of receiving this small pittance, he had toiled hard, doing overwork in order to make the buckle and strap meet. Once he had been sold on the auction block, a sister of his that also shared the same fate. While seriously contemplating his life as a slave, he was soon led to the conclusion that it was his duty to bend his entire energies towards freeing himself and his family, if possible. The idea of not being able to properly provide for his family rendered him quite unhappy. He therefore resolved to seek a passage north via the Underground Railroad. To any captain who would aid him in the matter, he resolved to offer a large reward and determined that the amount should only be limited by his inability to increase it. Finally, after much anxious preparation, arrangement was entered into with Captain B. on behalf of himself, wife and child, and Louisa Bell, which was mutually satisfactory to all concerned, and afforded great hope to William. In due time the agreement was carried into effect, and all arrived safely, and were delivered into the hands of the committee in Philadelphia. The fare of the four cost two hundred and forty dollars, and William was only too grateful to think that a captain could be found who would risk his own liberty in thus aiding a slave to freedom. The committee gladly gave them aid and succor, and agreed with William that the captain deserved all that he received for their deliverance. The arrival of William, wife and child in Canada, was duly announced by the agent at St. Catherine's, Rev. H. Wilson, as follows. St. Catherine, C.W., June 28, 1855. Mr. William Still. My dear friend, I am happy to announce the safe arrival of Thomas Russell and his wife and child. They have just arrived. I am much pleased with their appearance. I shall do what I can for their comfort and encouragement. They stopped at Elmira from Monday night until this morning, hoping that Lucy Bell would come up and join them in that place. They are very anxious to hear from her, as they have failed of meeting with her on the way or finding her in advance of them. They wish to hear from you as soon as you can write, and would like to know if you have forwarded Lucy on, and if so, what route you sent her. They send their kind respects to you and your family, and many thanks for your kindness to them. They wish you to inquire after Lucy if any harm has befallen her after her leaving Philadelphia. Please write promptly, in my care. Here's truly in the love of freedom, Hiram Wilson. The man who came to us as William Nelson is now known only as Thomas Russell. It may be here remarked that, owing to the general custom of changing names, as here instance, it is found difficult to tell to whom the letters severally refer. Where the old and new names were both carefully entered on the book, there is no difficulty, of course, but it was not always thus. Susan Bell, the wife of William, was about thirty years of age, of a dark color, rather above medium size, well made, good looking, and intelligent, quite equal to her husband, and appeared to have his affections undividedly. She was owned by Thomas Baltimore, with whom she had lived for the last seven years. She stated that during a part of her life she had been treated in a mild manner. She had no complaint to make until after the marriage of her master. Under the new wife and mistress, Susan found a very marked change for the worse. She fared badly enough then. The mistress, on every trifling occasion for complaint, was disposed to hold the auction block up to Susan, and would likewise influence her husband to do the same. From the fact that four of Susan's sisters had been sold away to parts unknown, 
She was not prepared to relish these almost daily threats from her irritable mistress, so she became anxious for a trip on the Underground Railroad, as was her husband. About one hundred miles away in the country, her father, mother, three brothers, and one sister were living, but she felt that she could not remain a slave on their account. Susan's owner had already fixed a price on her and her child, twenty-two months old, which was one thousand dollars. From this fate she was saved only by her firm resolution to seek her freedom. Louisa Bell was also of William Nelson's party, and a fair specimen of a nice-looking, wide-awake woman of a chestnut color, twenty-eight years of age. She was the wife of a free man, but the slave of L. Stasson, a confectioner. The almost constant ringing in her ears of the auction block made her most miserable, especially as she had once suffered terribly by being sold, and had likewise seen her mother and five sisters placed in the same unhappy situation, the thought of which never ceased to be most painful. In reflecting upon the course which she was about to pursue in order to free herself from the prison house, she felt more keenly than ever for her little children, and readily imagined how sadly she would mourn while thinking of them, hundreds of miles distant, growing up only to be slaves, and particularly would her thoughts dwell upon her boy, six years of age, full, old enough to feel deeply the loss of his mother, but without hope of ever seeing her again. Heartbreaking as were these reflections, she resolved to leave Robert and Mary in the hands of God, and escape, if possible, from her terrible thraldom. Her plan was submitted to her husband. He acquiesced fully, and promised to follow her as soon as an opportunity might present itself. Although the ordeal that she was called upon to pass through was of the most trying nature, she bravely endured the journey through to Canada. On her arrival there, the Rev. H. Wilson wrote on behalf of herself and the cause as follows. St. Catherine's C.W., July 6, 1855. Dear Brother Still, I have just received your letters touching U.G.R.R. operations. All is right. Jasper and Mrs. Bell got here on Saturday last, and I think I dropped you a line announcing the fact. I write again thus soon because two more by the name of Smith, John, and William have arrived the present week, and were anxious to have me inform you that they are safely landed and free in this refuge land. They wish me to communicate their kind regards to you and others who have aided them. They have found employment and are likely to do well. The five of last week have gone over to Toronto. I gave them letters to a friend there after furnishing them as well as I could with such clothing as they required. I am afraid that I am burdening you too much with postage, but I can't help doing so unless I fail to write at all, as my means are not half equal to the expenses to which I am subject. Faithfully and truly yours, Hiram Wilson. Elias Jasper, who was also a fellow passenger with William Nelson and company, was noticed thus on the Underground Railroad. Age thirty-two years, color dark, features good, and gifted both with his tongue and hands. He had worked more or less at the following trades, rope-making, carpentering, engineering, and photographing. It was in this latter calling that he was engaged when the Underground Railroad movement first arrested his attention, and so continued until his departure. For several years he had been accustomed to hire his time, for which he had been required to pay ten dollars per month. In acquiring the above trades he had been at no expense to his master, as he had learned them solely by his own perseverance, endowed as he was with a considerable share of genius. Occasionally he paid for lessons, the money being earned by his overwork. His master, Baham, was a retired gentleman. Elias had been sold once and had suffered in various other ways, particularly from being flogged. He left his wife, Mary, but no child. Of his intention to leave, Elias saw not how to impart to his wife, lest she should in some way let the cat out of the bag. She was owned by Miss Portlock, and had been treated tolerably well. 
having had the privilege of hiring her time. She had fifty-five dollars to pay for this favor, which amount she raised by washing, etc. Elias was a member of the Methodist Church, as were all of his comrades, and well did they remember the oft-repeated lesson, Servants obey your masters, etc. They soon understood this kind of preaching after breathing free air. The market value of Elias was placed at twelve hundred dollars. Arrival number four, Maria Joyner. Captain F. arrived from Norfolk with the above-named passenger, the way not being open to risk any other on that occasion. This seemed rather slow business with this voyager, for he was usually accustomed to bring more than one. However, as this arrival was only one day later than the preceding one noticed, and came from the same place, the committee concluded that they had much reason for rejoicing nevertheless. As in the case of a great number among the oppressed of the South, when simply looking at Maria no visible marks of ill-usage in any way were discernible. Indeed, as she then appeared at the age of thirty-three, a fine, fresh, and healthy-looking mulatto woman, nine out of every ten would have been impressed with the idea that she had never been subjected to hard treatment. In other words, that she had derived her full share of advantages from the patriarchal institution. The appearance of just such persons in southern cities had often led northerners, when traveling in those parts, to regard the lot of slaves as quite comfortable, but the story of Maria, told in an earnest and intelligent manner, was at once calculated to dissipate the idea of a comfortable existence in a state of bondage. She frankly admitted, however, that prior to the death of her old master, she was favorably treated, compared with many others, but unfortunately, after his death, she had fallen into the hands of one of the man's daughters, from whom she declared that she had received continued abuse, especially when said daughter was under the influence of liquor. At such times she was very violent. Being spirited, Maria could not consent to suffer on as a slave in this manner. Consequently, she began to cogitate how she might escape from her mistress, Catherine Gordon, and reach a free state. None other than the usual trying and hazardous ways could be devised, which was either to be stowed away in the hold of a schooner or concealed amongst the rubbish of a steamer, where for the first time being the extreme suffering was sure to tax every nerve of even the most valiant-hearted men. The daily darkening prospects constrained her to decide that she was willing to suffer, not only in adopting this mode of travel, but on the other hand that she had better be dead than remain under so cruel a woman as her mistress. Maria's husband and sister, no other relatives or noticed, were naturally formidable barriers in the way of her escape. Notwithstanding her attachment to them, she fully made up her mind to be free. Immediately she took the first prerequisite step, which was to repair to a place of concealment with a friend in the city, and there, like the man at the pool, wait until her turn came to be conveyed thence to a free state. In this place she was obliged to wait eight long months, enduring daily suffering in various ways, especially during the winter season, but with martyr-like faith she endured to the end, was eventually saved from the hell of slavery. Marie was appraised at eight hundred dollars. End of section 30 Recorded by Kevin Davidson www.blogordie.com Section 31 of the Underground Railroad, Part 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kevin Davidson. The Underground Railroad, Part 2, by William Still. Section 31. Sundry Arrivals, Part 2. Arrival 5th. Richard Green and his brother George. Arrival 6th. Henry Cromwell. Arrival 7th. Henry Bohm. Arrival 8th. Ralph Whiting. James H. Foreman. Anthony Atkinson. Arthur Jones. Isaiah Nixon. Joseph Harris. John Morris. Henry Hodges. Arrival 9th. 
Robert Jones and wife. Arrival number five. Richard Green, alias William Smith, and his brother George. These young brothers fled from George Chambers of Baltimore. The elder brother was twenty-five, the younger twenty-three. Both were tall and well-made, of a chestnut color, and possessed a good degree of natural ability. When desiring to visit their parents, their request was positively refused by their owner. Taking offense at this step, both mutually resolved to run away at the earliest opportunity. Thus, in accordance with well-premeditated plans, they set out and unobstructedly arrived in Philadelphia. At first it was simply very pleasant to take them by the hand and welcome them, then to listen for a few moments to their intelligent narration of how they escaped, the motives that prompted them, etc. But further inquiry soon brought out incidents of the most thrilling and touching nature, not with regard to hardships which they had personally experienced, but in relation to outrages which had been perpetrated upon their mother. Such simple facts as were then written are substantially as follows. Nearly thirty years prior to the escape of Richard and his brother, their mother was in very bad health, so much so that physicians regarded her as incurable. Her owner was evidently fully impressed with the belief that instead of being profitable to him, she might be an expense, which he could not possibly obviate, while he retained her as a slave. Now there was a way to get out of this dilemma. He could emancipate her and throw the responsibility of her support upon herself. Accordingly, he drew up papers, called for his wife's mother to witness them, then formally put them into the hands of the invalid slave woman, Dinah, assuring her at the same time that she was free, being fully released as set forth in her papers. Take notice, I have no more claims on you, nor you upon me from this time. Marvelous liberality! After working the life out of a woman, in order that he should not have her to bury, he becomes hastily in favor of freedom. He is, however, justified by the laws of Maryland. Complaint, therefore, would simply amount to nothing. In the nature of the case, Dinah was now free, but she was not wholly alone in the world. She had a husband named Jacob Green, who was owned by Nathan Childs for a term of years only, at the expiration of which time he was to be free. All lived then in Talbot County, Maryland. At the appointed time Jacob's bondage ended, and he concluded that he might succeed better by moving to Baltimore. Indeed, the health of his wife was so miserable that nothing in his old home seemed to offer any inducement in the way of livelihood. So off they moved to Baltimore. After a time, under careful and kind treatment, the faithful Jacob was greatly encouraged by perceiving that the health of his companion was gradually improving. Signs indicated that she might yet become a well woman. The hopes of husband and wife in this particular were in the lapse of time fully realized. Dinah was as well as ever, and became the mother of another child, a little boy. Everything seemed to be going on happily they had no apparent reason to suspect any troubles other than such as might naturally have to be encountered in the state of poverty and toil. The unfettered boy was healthy and made rapid advance in a few years. That any one should ever claim him was never for a moment feared. The old master, however, becoming tired of country life, had also moved to Baltimore. How, they knew not, but he had heard of the existence of this boy. That he might satisfy himself on this point, he one day very shyly approached the house with George. No sooner was the old man within the enclosures than he asked Dinah, whose child is that, pointing to the boy. Ask Jacob, was the reply of the mother. The question was then put to Jacob, the father of the boy. I did not think that you would ask such a question, or that you would request anything like that, Jacob remarked, naturally somewhat nervous, but he added, I have the privilege of having any one I please in my house. Where is he from? again demanded the master. The father repeated, I have a right to have, etc. I am my own man, etc. I have found out whose he is, the hunter said. I am going presently to take him home with me. At this juncture he sees the little fellow, at the same time calling out, Dinah put his clothes on. By this time the father, too, had seized hold of the child. Mustering courage, the father said, 
Take notice that you are not in the country, pulling and hauling people about. I will have him, or I will leave my heart's blood in this house, was the savage declaration of the master. In his rage he threatened to shoot the father. In the midst of the excitement, George called in two officers to settle the trouble. What are you doing here? said the officers to the slaveholder. I am after my property, this boy, he exclaimed. Have you ever seen it before? they inquired. No, said the slaveholder. Then how do you know that he belongs to you? inquired the officers. I believe he is mine, replied the slaveholder. All the parties concerned were then taken by the officers before an alderman. The father owned the child, but the mother denied it. The alderman then decided that the child should be given to the father. The slaveholder, having thus failed, was unwilling, nevertheless, to relinquish his grasp, whereupon he at once claimed the mother. Of course, he was under the necessity of resorting to the courts in order to establish his claim. Fortunately, the mother had securely preserved the paper given her by her master so many years before, releasing her. Notwithstanding this, the suit was pending nearly a year before the case was decided. Everything was so clear the mother finally gained the suit. This decision was rendered only about two months prior to the escape of Richard and George. Arrival number six, Henry Cromwell. This passenger fled from Baltimore County, Maryland. The man that he escaped from was a farmer by the name of William Roberts, who also owned seven other young slaves. Of his treatment of his slaves, nothing was recorded. Henry was about six feet high, quite black, visage thin, age twenty-five. He left neither wife, parents, brothers, nor sisters to grieve after him. In making his way north, he walked of nights from his home to Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, and there availed himself of a passage on a freight car coming to Philadelphia. Arrival number seven, Henry Bohm. Henry came from near Norfolk, Virginia. He was about twenty-five years of age and a fair specimen of a stout man, possessed of more than ordinary physical strength. As to whom he fled from, how he had been treated, or how he reached Philadelphia, the record book is silent. Why this is the case cannot now be accounted for, unless the hurry of getting him off forbade sufficient delay to note down more of the particulars. Arrival number eight, Ralph Whiting, James H. Foreman, Anthony Atkinson, Arthur Jones, Isaiah Nixon, Joseph Harris, John Morris, and Henry Hodges. A numerous party like this had the appearance of business. They were all young and hopeful, and belonged to the more intelligent and promising of their race. They were capable of giving the best of reasons for the endeavors they were making to escape to a free country. They imparted to the committee much information respecting their several situations, together with the characters of their masters in relation to domestic matters and the customs and usages under which they had been severally held to service, all of which was listened to with deep interest. But it was not an easy matter, after having been thus entertained, to write out the narratives of eight such persons. Hundreds of pages would hardly have contained a brief account of the most interesting portion of their histories. It was deemed sufficient to enter their names and their forsaken homes, etc., as follows. Ralph was twenty-six years of age, five feet ten inches high, dark, well-made, intelligent, and a member of the Methodist Church. He was claimed by George W. Kemp, Esquire, cashier of the Exchange Bank of Norfolk, Virginia. Ralph gave Mr. Kemp the credit of being a moderate man to his slaves. Ralph was compelled to leave his wife, Lydia, and two children, Anna, Eliza, and Cornelius. James was twenty-three years of age, dark mulatto, nearly six feet high and of a prepossessing appearance. He fled from James Saunders, Esquire. Nothing save the desire to be free prompted James to leave his old situation and master. His parents and two sisters he was obliged to leave in Norfolk. Two brief letters from James, one concerning his sweetheart, whom he left in Norfolk, the other giving an account of her arrival in Canada and marriage, thereafter will doubtless be read with interest. They are here given as follows. Niagara Falls, June 5, 1856. Mr. Still. Sir, I take my pen in hand to write you these few lines to let you know that I am well at present, and hope these few lines may find you the same. Sir, my object in writing you is that I expect a young lady by the name of Miss Mariah Moore from Norfolk, Virginia. 
She will leave Norfolk on the 13th of this month in the steamship Virginia for Philadelphia. You will oblige me very much by seeing her safely on the train of cars that leaves Philadelphia for the suspension bridge Niagara Falls. Please to tell the lady to telegraph to me what time she will leave Philadelphia so that I may know what time to meet her at the suspension bridge. My brother Isaac Poorman send his love, also his family to you and your family. They are all at well present. Please to give my respects to Mr. Harry Londe, also Miss Margaret Cunnigan. No more at present. I remain your friend, James H. Foreman. When you telegraph to me, direct to the International Hotel, Niagara Falls, New York, Niagara Falls, July twenty fourth, 1856, dear sir, I take this opportunity of writing these few lines to you, hoping that they may find you enjoying good health, as these few lines leave me at present. I thank you for your kindness. Miss Moore arrived here on the 30th of June, and I was down to the cars to receive her. I thought I would have written to you before, but I thought I would wait till I got married. I got married on the 22nd of July in the English Church, Canada. About eleven o'clock, my wife sends all her love to you and your wife and all inquiring friends pleased to kiss your two children for her, and she says she is done crying, and I am glad to hear she enjoyed herself so well in Philadelphia. Give my respects to Miss Margaret Cunningham, and I am glad to hear her sister arrived. My father sends his respects to you, no more at present, but remain your friend, James H. Foreman." Direct your letter to the International Hotel, Niagara Falls. Anthony was thirty-six years of age and by blood, and was quite nearly related to the Anglo-Saxon as the Anglo-African. He was nevertheless physically a fine specimen of a man. He was about six feet high, and bore evidence of having picked up a considerable amount of intelligence, considering his opportunities. He had been sold three times. Anthony was decidedly opposed to having to pass through this ordeal a fourth time. Therefore, the more he meditated over his condition, the more determined he became to seek out an underground railroad agent and make his way to Canada. Concluding that Josiah Wells, who claimed him, had received a thousand times too much of his labor already, Anthony was in a fit state of mind to make a resolute effort to gain his freedom. He had a wife, but no children. His father, one sister, and two brothers were all dear to him, but all being slaves, one could not help the other. Anthony reasoned, and wisely, too. So at the command of the captain he was ready to bear his part of the suffering consequent upon being concealed in the hold of a vessel where but little air could penetrate. Arthur was forty-one years of age, six feet high, chestnut color, well made, and possessed good native faculties needing cultivation. He escaped from a farmer by the name of John Jones, who was classed as to natural temperament amongst moderate slaveholders. "'I wanted my liberty,' said Arthur promptly and emphatically, and he declared that was the cause of his escape. He left his mother, two sisters, and three brothers in slavery. Isaiah was about twenty-two, small of stature, but smart, and of a substantially black complexion. He had been subjected to very hard treatment under Samuel Simmons, who claimed him, and on this account he was first prompted to leave. His mother and three brothers he left in bondage. Joseph was twenty-three years of age and was, in every way, likely-looking. According to the laws of slavery, he was the property of David Morris, who was entitled to be ranked among the more compassionate slaveholders of the South. Yet Joseph was not satisfied, the pride of his freedom. He had not known hardships as many had, but it was not in him, notwithstanding, to be contented as a slave. In leaving, he had to tear himself away from his parents, three brothers, and two sisters. Henry escaped from S. Simmons of Plymouth, North Carolina, and was a fellow servant with Isaiah. Simmons was particularly distinguished for his tyrannical rule and treatment of his slaves, so Henry and Isaiah had the good sense to withdraw from under his yoke, very young in life, Henry being twenty-three. John was about twenty-one years of age, five feet eight inches high, dark color, and well-grown for his years. Before embarking, he endured seven months of hard suffering from being secreted, 
waiting for an opportunity to escape. It was to keep his master from selling him that he was thus induced to secrete himself. After he had remained away some months, he resolved to suffer on until his friends could manage to procure him a passage on the Underground Railroad. With this determined spirit, he did not wait in vain. Arrival number nine. Robert Jones and wife. In the majority of cases, in order to effect the escape of either, sad separations between husbands and wives were unavoidable. Fortunately, it was not so in this case. In journeying from the house of bondage, Robert and his wife were united both in sympathies and in struggles. Robert had experienced hard times, just in what way, however, was not recorded. His wife had been differently treated, not being under the same taskmaster as her husband. At the time of their arrival, all that was recorded of their bondage is as follows. August 2, 1855. Robert Jones and wife arrived from Petersburg, Virginia. Robert is about 35, chestnut color, medium size, of good manners, intelligent, had been owned by Thomas N. Lee, a very hard man. Robert left because he wanted his liberty, always had from a boy. Eliza, his wife, is about 40 years of age, chestnut color, nice-looking, and well-dressed. She belonged to Eliza H. Ritchie, who was called a moderate woman toward her slaves. Notwithstanding the limited space occupied in noting them in the record book, the committee regarded them as being among the most worthy and brave travelers passing over the Underground Railroad, and felt well satisfied that such specimens of humanity would do credit in Canada, not only to themselves but to their race. Robert had succeeded in learning to read and write tolerably well, and had thought much over the condition and wrongs of the race, and seemed to be eager to be where he could do something to lift his fellow sufferers up to a higher plane of liberty and manhood. After an interview with Robert and his wife, in every way so agreeable, they were forwarded on in the usual manner to Canada. While enjoying the sweets of freedom in Canada, he was not the man to keep his light under a bushel. He seemed to have a high appreciation of the potency of the pen, and a decidedly clear idea that colored men needed to lay hold of many enterprises with resolution in order to prove themselves qualified to rise equally with other branches of the human family. Some of his letters embracing his views, plans, and suggestions were so encouraging and sensible that the committee was in the habit of showing them to friendly persons, and indeed extracts of some of his letters were deemed of sufficient importance to publish. One alone, taken from many letters received from him, must here suffice to illustrate his intelligence and efforts as a fugitive and citizen in Canada. Hamilton, C.W., August 9, 1856. Mr. William Still, dear friend, I take this opportunity of writing you these few lines to inform you of my health, which is good, at present, etc. I was talking to you about going to Liberia when I last saw you, and did intend to start this fall, but since I have looked at the condition of the colored people in Canada, I thought I would try to do something for their elevation as a nation, to place them in the proper position to stand where they ought to stand. In order to do this, I have undertaken to get up a military company amongst them. They laughed at me to undertake such a thing, but I did not relax my energies. I went and had an interview with Major J. T. Gillipon, told him what my object was, he encouraged me to go on, saying that he would do all he could for the accomplishment of my object. He referred to Sir Allen McNabb, etc. I took with me Mr. J. H. Hill to see him. He told me that it should be done, and required us to write a petition to the Governor-General, which has been done. The company is already organized. Mr. Howard was elected captain, J. H. Hill, first lieutenant, Hezekiah Hill, ensign, Robert Jones, first sergeant. The company's name is Queen Victoria's Rifle Guards. You may by this see what I have been doing since I have been in Canada. When we receive our appointments by the government, I will send by express my daguerreotype in uniform. My respects, etc., etc., Robert Jones. End of section 31. Recording by Kevin Davidson. www.blogordie dot com.
Section 32 of the Underground Railroad Part 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson. The Underground Railroad Part 2 by William Still. Section 32. Heavy Reward. $2,600 reward. Ran away from the subscriber on Saturday night. November 15th, 1856. Josiah and William Bailey and Peter Pennington. Joe is about 5 feet 10 inches in height, of a chestnut color, bald head, with a remarkable scar on one of his cheeks. Not positive on which it is, but think it is on the left, under the eye. Has intelligent countenance, active and well made. He is about 28 years old. Bill is of a darker color, about 5 feet 8 inches in height. Stammers when a little confused, well made, and older than Joe, well dressed, but may have pulled Kersey on over their other clothes. Peter is smaller than either of the others, about twenty five years of age, dark chestnut colour, five feet seven or eight inches high. A reward of fifteen hundred dollars will be given to any person who will apprehend the said Joe Bailey and lodge him safely in the jail at Easton, Talbot County, Maryland, and three hundred dollars for Bill and eight hundred dollars for peter w r hewlett john c henry t wright when this arrival made its appearance it was at first sight quite evident that one of the company was a man of more than ordinary parts both physically and mentally likewise taking them individually their appearance and bearing tended largely to strengthen the idea that the spirit of freedom was rapidly gaining ground in the minds of the slaves, despite the efforts of the slaveholders to keep them in darkness. In company with the three men, for whom the above large reward was offered, came a woman by the name of Eliza Noki. As soon as the opportunity presented itself, the active committee, feeling an unusual desire to hear their story, began the investigation by inquiring as to the cause of their escape, etc., which brought simple and homely but earnest answers from each. These answers afforded the best possible means of seeing slavery in its natural, practical workings, of obtaining such testimony and representations of the vile system as the most eloquent orator or able pen might labour in vain to make clear and convincing. Although this arrival had obviously been owned by men of high standing, the fugitives themselves innocently stated that one of the masters, who was in the habit of flogging adult females, was a moderate man. Josiah Bailey was the leader of this party, and he appeared well qualified for this position. He was about twenty-nine years of age, and in no particular physically did he seem to be deficient. He was likewise civil and polite in his manners, and a man of good common sense. He was held and oppressed by William H. Hewlett, a farmer and dealer in ship timber, who had besides invested in slaves to the number of forty head. In his habits he was generally taken for a moderate and fair man, though he was in the habit of flogging the slaves, females as well as males, after they had arrived at the age of maturity. This was not considered strange or cruel in Maryland. Josiah was the foreman on the place, and was entrusted with the management of hauling the ship timber, and through harvesting and busy seasons was required to lead in the fields. He was regarded as one of the most valuable hands in that part of the country, being valued at $2,000. Three weeks before he escaped, Joe was stripped naked and flogged very cruelly by his master, simply because he had a dispute with one of the fellow servants, who had stolen, as Joe alleged, seven dollars of his hard earnings. This flogging produced in Joe's mind an unswerving determination to leave slavery or die to try his luck on the underground railroad at all hazards the very name of slavery made the fire fairly burn in his bones although a married man having a wife and three children owned by hewlett he was not prepared to let his affection for them keep him in chains so anna maria his wife and his children ellen anna maria and isabella were shortly widowed and orphaned by the slave lash William Bailey was owned by John C. Henry, a large slaveholder and a very hard one, if what William alleged of him was true. His story certainly had every appearance of truthfulness. A recent brutal flogging had stiffened his backbone, 
and furnished him with his excuse for not being willing to continue in Maryland, working his strength away to enrich his master, or the man who claimed to be such. The memorable flogging, however, which caused him to seek flight on the Underground Railroad, was not administered by his master, or on his master's plantation. He was hired out, and it was in this situation that he was so barbarously treated. Yet he considered his master more in fault than the man to whom he was hired, but redress there was none, save to escape. The hour for forwarding the party by the committee came too soon to allow time for the writing of any account of Peter Pennington and Eliza Noki. Suffice it to say that in struggling through their journey, their spirits never flagged. They had determined not to stop short of Canada. They truly had a very high appreciation of freedom, but a very poor opinion of Maryland. Slave Trader Hall is foiled. Robert McCoy, alias William Dona. In October 1854, the committee received per steamer, directly from Norfolk, Virginia, Robert McCoy and Elizabeth Saunders. Robert had constantly been in the clutches of the Negro Trader Hall for the last sixteen years, previous to his leaving being owned by him. He had, therefore, possessed very favourable opportunities for varied observation and experience relative to the trader's conduct in his nefarious business, as well as for witnessing the effects of the auction block upon all ages, rending asunder the dearest ties, despite the piteous wails of childhood or womanhood, parental or conjugal relations. But no attempt will be made to chronicle the deeds of this dealer in human flesh. Those stories fresh from the lips of one who had just escaped were painful in the extreme, but in the very nature of things some of the statements are too revolting to be published. In lieu of this fact, except the above allusions to the trader's business, this sketch will only refer to Robert's condition as a slave, and finally as a traveller on the Underground Railroad. Robert was a man of medium size, dark mulatto, of more than ordinary intelligence. His duties had been confined to the house and not to the slave pen. As a general thing, he had managed, doubtless through much shrewdness, to avoid very severe outrages from the trader. On the whole, he had fared about as well as the generality of slaves. Yet, in order to free himself from his miserable life, he was willing, as he declared, to suffer almost any sacrifice. Indeed, his conduct proved the sincerity of this declaration, as he had actually been concealed five months in a place in the city, where he could not possibly avoid daily suffering of the most trying kind. His resolve to be free was all this while maturing. The trader had threatened to sell Robert, and to prevent it Robert thus took out. Successfully did he elude the keen scent and grasp of the hunters, who made diligent efforts to recapture him. Although a young man, only about twenty-eight years of age, his health was by no means good. His system had evidently been considerably shattered by slavery, and symptoms of consumption, together with chronic rheumatism, were making rapid headway against the physical man. Under his various ills, he declared, as did many others from the land of bondage, that his faith in God afforded him comfort and hope. He was obliged to leave his wife Eliza in bonds, not knowing whether they should ever meet again on earth. But he was somewhat hopeful that the way would open for her escape also. After reaching Philadelphia, where his arrival had long been anticipated by the Vigilance Committee, his immediate wants were met, and in due order he was forwarded to New Bedford, where, he was led to feel, he would be happy in freedom. Scarcely had he been in New Bedford one month before his prayers and hopes were realised with regard to the deliverance of his wife. On hearing of the good news of her coming, he wrote as follows. New Bedford, November 3rd, 1859. Dear Sir, I embrace this opportunity to inform you that I received your letter with pleasure. I am enjoying good health and hope that these few lines will find you enjoying the same blessing. I rejoice to hear from you. I feel very much indebted to you for not writing before. But I have been so busy that is the cause. I rejoice to hear of the arrival of my wife and hope she is not sick from the rolling of the sea. And if she is not, please to send her on here Monday with a six-barrel wallion and a rifle to guard her up against my residence. I thank you kindly for the good that you have done for me. Give my respects to Mrs. Still. Tell her I want to see her very bad, and you also I will come, but I am afraid, yet to venture. I received your letter the second, but about the first of spring I hope to pay you a visit or next summer. 
I am getting something to do every day. I will write on her arrival and tell you more. Mr. R. White sends his love to you and your family, and says that he is very much indebted to you for his not writing, and also he desires to know whether his clothes has arrived yet or not, and if they are, please to express them on to him, or if at present by Mrs. Donner. Not any more at present. I remain your affectionate brother, William Donor. By the same arrival, and similarly secreted, Elizabeth Francis, alias Ellen Saunders, had the good luck to reach Philadelphia. She was a single young woman, about twenty-two, with as pleasant a countenance as one would wish to see. Her manners were equally agreeable. Perhaps her joy over her achieved victory added somewhat to her personal appearance. She had, however, belonged to the more favoured class of slaves. She had neither been overworked nor badly abused. Elizabeth was the property of a lady a few shades lighter than herself. Elizabeth was a mulatto, by the name of Sarah Shepherd of Norfolk. In order the more effectually to profit by Elizabeth's labour, the mistress resorted to the plan of hiring out for a given sum per month. Against this usage, Elizabeth urged no complaint. Indeed, the only very serious charge she brought was to the effect that her mistress sold her mother away from her far south, when she was a child only ten years old. She had also sold a brother and sister to a foreign southern market. The reflections consequent upon the course that her mistress had thus pursued awakened Elizabeth to much study relative to freedom, and by the time that she had reached womanhood, she had very decided convictions touching her duty with regard to escaping. Thus, growing to hate slavery in every way and manner, she was prepared to make a desperate effort to be free. Having saved thirty-five dollars by rigid economy, she was willing to give every cent of it, although it was all she possessed, to be aided from Norfolk to Philadelphia. After reaching the city, having suffered severely while coming, she was invited to remain until somewhat recruited. In the healthy air of freedom she was soon fully restored, and ready to take her departure for New Bedford, which place she reached without difficulty, and was cordially welcomed. The following letter, expressive of her obligations for aid received, was forwarded soon after her arrival in New Bedford. New Bedford, Massachusetts, October 16, 1854 Mr. Still, Dear Sir, I now take my pen in my hand to inform you of my health, which is good at present, all except a cold I have got, but I hope when these few lines reach you, you may be enjoying good health. I arrived in New Bedford Thursday morning safely, and what little I have seen of the city I like very much. My friends were very glad to see me. I found my sister very well. Give my love to Mrs. Still, and also your dear little children. I am now out at service. I do not think of going to Canada now. I think I shall remain in this city this winter. Please tell Mrs. Still... I have not met any person who has treated me any kinder than she did since I left. I consider you both to have been true friends to me. I hope you will think me the same to you. I feel very thankful to you indeed. It might be supposed out of sight, out of mind, but it is not so. I never forget my friends. Give my love to Florence. If you will come to this city, I will be very happy to see you. Kiss your dear little children for me. Please answer this as soon as possible, so that I may know how you receive this. No more at present. I still remain your friend, Ellen Saunders. Eliza McCoy, the wife of Robert McCoy, whose narrative has just been given, and who was left to wait in hope when her husband escaped, soon followed him to freedom. It is the source of great satisfaction to be able to present her narrative in so close proximity to her husband's. He arrived about the 1st of October, she about the first of november following from her lips testimony of much weight and interest was listened to by several friends relative to her sufferings as a slave on the auction block and in a place of concealment seven months waiting and praying for an opportunity to escape but it was thought sufficient to record merely a very brief outline of her active slave life which consisted of the following noticeable features eliza had been owned by andrew sigony of norfolk age about thirty-eight, mulatto, and a woman whose appearance would readily command attention and respect anywhere outside of the barbarism of slavery. She stated that her experience as a sufferer in cruel hands had been very trying, and that in fretting under hardships she had always wanted to be free. Her language was unmistakable on this point. 
Neither mistress nor servant were satisfied with each other. The mistress was so queer and hard to please that Eliza became heartily sick of trying to please her. An angel would have failed with such a woman. So, while matters were getting no better, but, on the contrary, were growing worse and worse, Eliza thought she would seek a more pleasant atmosphere in the north. In fact, she felt that it would afford her no little relief to allow her place to be occupied by another. When she went into close quarters of concealment, she fully understood what was meant and all the liabilities thereto. She had pluck enough to endure unto the end without murmuring. The martyrs in olden times who dwelt in dens and caves of the earth could hardly have fared worse than some of these way-worn travellers. After the rest, needed by one who had suffered so severely until her arrival in Philadelphia, she was forwarded to her anxiously waiting husband in New Bedford, where she was gladly received. From the frequent arrivals from Virginia, especially in steamers, it may be thought that no very stringent laws or regulations existed by which offenders who might aid the Underground Railroad could be severely punished, that the slaveholders were lenient, indifferent, and unguarded as to how this property took wings and escaped. In order to enlighten the reader with regard to this subject, it seems necessary in this connection to publish at least one of the many statutes from the slave laws of the South bearing directly on the aid and escape of slaves by vessels. The following enactment is given as passed by the legislature of Virginia in 1856. End of section 32section thirty three of the underground railroad part two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by greg giordano the underground railroad part two by william still section thirty three the protection of slave property in virginia a bill providing additional protection for the slave property of citizens of this commonwealth one be it enacted by the general assembly that it shall not be lawful for any vessel of any size or description whatever owned in whole or in part by any citizen or resident of another state and about to sail or steam for any port or place in this state for any port or place north of and beyond the capes of virginia to depart from the waters of this commonwealth until said vessel has undergone the inspection hereinafter provided for in this act and received a certificate to that effect if any such vessel shall depart from the state without such certificate of inspection the captain or owner thereof shall forfeit and pay the sum of five hundred dollars to be recovered by any person who will sue for the same in any court of record in this state in the name of the governor of the commonwealth pending such suit the vessel of said captain or owner shall not leave the state until bond be given by the captain or owner or other person for him payable to the governor with two or three sureties satisfactory to the court in the penalty of one thousand dollars for the payment of the forfeit or fine together with the cost and expenses incurred in enforcing the same and in default of such bond the vessel shall be held liable provided that nothing contained in this section shall apply to vessels belonging to the united states government or vessels american or foreign bound direct to any foreign country other than the british american provinces two the pilots licensed under the laws of virginia and while attached to a vessel regularly employed as a pilot boat are hereby constituted inspectors to execute this act so far as the same may be applicable to the chesapeake bay and the waters tributary thereto within the jurisdiction of this state together with such other inspectors as may be appointed by virtue of this act three the branch or license issued to a pilot according to the provisions of the ninety-second chapter of code shall be sufficient evidence that he is authorized and empowered to act as inspector as aforesaid four it shall be the duty of the inspector or other person authorized to act under this law to examine and search all vessels herein before described to see that no slave or person held to service or labor in the state or person charged with the commission of any crime within the state 
shall be concealed on board said vessel such inspection shall be made within twelve hours of the time of departure of such vessel from the waters of virginia and may be made in any bay river creek or other water course of the state provided however that steamers plying as regular packets between ports in virginia and those north of and outside of the capes of virginia shall be inspected at the port of departure nearest old point comfort five a vessel so inspected and getting under way with intent to leave the waters of the state if she returns to an anchorage above back river point or within old point comfort shall be again inspected and charged as if in original case if such vessel be driven back by stress of weather to seek a harbor she shall be exempt from payment of a second fee unless she holds intercourse with the shore six if after searching the vessel the inspector see no just cause to detain her he shall give to the captain a certificate to that effect if however upon such inspection or in any other manner any slave or person held to service or labor or any person charged with any crime be found on board of any vessel whatever for the purpose aforesaid or said vessel be detected in the act of leaving this commonwealth with any such slave or person on board or otherwise violating the provisions of this act he shall attach said vessel and arrest all persons on board to be delivered up to the sergeant or sheriff of the nearest port in this commonwealth to be dealt with according to law seven if any inspector or other officer be opposed or shall have reason to suspect that he will be opposed or obstructed in the discharge of any duty required of him under this act he shall have power to summon and command the force of any county or corporation to aid him in the discharge of such duty and every person who shall resist obstruct or refuse to aid any inspector or other officer in the discharge of such duty shall be deemed guilty of a misdemeanor and upon conviction thereof shall be fined and imprisoned as in other cases of misdemeanor eight for every inspection of a vessel under this law the inspector or other officer shall be entitled to demand and receive the sum of five dollars for the payment of which such vessel shall be liable and the inspector or other officer may seize and hold her until the same is paid together with all charges incurred in taking care of the vessel as well as in enforcing the payment of the same provided that steam packets trading regularly between the waters of virginia and points north of and beyond the capes of virginia shall pay not more than five dollars for each inspection under the provisions of this act provided however that for every inspection of a vessel engaged in the coal trade the inspector shall not receive a greater sum than two dollars nine any inspector or other person apprehending a slave in the act of escaping from the state on board a vessel trading to or belonging to a non-slave-holding state or who shall give information that will lead to the recovery of any slave as aforesaid shall be entitled to a reward of one hundred dollars to be paid by the owner of such slave or by the fiduciary having charge of the estate to which such slave belongs and if the vessel be forfeited under the provisions of this act he shall be entitled to one half of the proceeds arising from the sale of the vessel and if the same amounts to one hundred dollars he shall not receive from the owner the above reward of one hundred dollars ten an inspector permitting a slave to escape for the want of proper exertion or by neglect in the discharge of his duty shall be fined one hundred dollars or if for like causes he permit a vessel which the law requires him to inspect to leave the state without inspection he shall be fined no less than twenty nor more than fifty dollars to be recovered by warrant by any person who will proceed against him eleven no pilot acting under the authority of the laws of the state shall pilot out of the jurisdiction of this state any such vessel as is described in this act which is not obtained and exhibited to him the certificate of inspection hereby required and if any pilot shall so offend he shall forfeit and pay not less than twenty or more than fifty dollars to be recovered in the mode prescribed in the next preceding section of this act twelve the courts of the several counties or corporations situated on the chesapeake bay or its tributaries by an order entered on record may appoint one or more inspectors at such place or places within their respective districts as they may deem necessary to prevent the escape or for the recapture of slaves attempting to escape beyond the limits of the state and to search or otherwise examine all vessels trading to such counties or corporations the expenses in such cases to be provided for by a levy on negroes now taxed by law 
but no inspection by county or corporation officers thus appointed shall supersede the inspection of such vessels by pilots and other inspectors as specially provided for in this act thirteen it shall be lawful for the county court of any county upon the application of five or more slaveholders residents of the counties where the application is made by an order of record to designate one or more police stations in their respective counties and a captain and three or more persons as a police patrol on each station for the recapture of fugitive slaves which patrol shall be in service at such times and such stations as the court shall direct by their order aforesaid and the said court shall allow a reasonable compensation to be paid by the members of such patrol and for that purpose the said court may from time to time direct a levy on negroes now taxed by law at such rate per capita as the court may think sufficient to be collected and accounted for by the sheriff as other county levies and to be called the fugitive slave tax the owner of each fugitive slave in the act of escaping beyond the limits of the commonwealth to a non-slave holding state and captured by the patrol aforesaid shall pay for each slave over fifteen and under forty-five years old a reward of one hundred dollars for each slave over five and under fifteen years old the sum of sixty dollars and for all others the sum of forty dollars which reward shall be divided equally among the members of the patrol retaking the slave and actually on duty at the time and to secure the payment of said reward the said patrol may retain possession and use of the slave until the reward is paid or secured to them fourteen the executive of this state may appoint one or more inspectors for the rappahannock and potomac rivers if he shall deem it expedient for the due execution of this act the inspectors so appointed to perform the same duties and to be invested with the same powers in their respective districts and receive the same fees as pilots acting as inspectors in other parts of the state a vessel subject to inspection under this law departing from any of the above-mentioned counties or rivers on her voyage to sea shall be exempted from the payment of a fee for a second inspection by another officer if provided with a certificate from the proper inspecting officer of that district but if after proceeding on her voyage she returns to the port or place of departure or enters any other port river or roadstead in the state the said vessel shall be again inspected and pay a fee of five dollars as if she had undergone no previous examination and received no previous certificate if driven by stress of weather to seek a harbor and she has no intercourse with the shore then and in that case no second fee shall be paid by said vessel fifteen for the better execution of the provisions of this act in regard to the inspection of vessels the executive is hereby authorized and directed to appoint a chief inspector to reside at norfolk whose duty it shall be to direct and superintend the police agents or inspectors above referred to he shall keep a record of all vessels engaged in the piloting business together with a list of such persons as may be employed as pilots and inspectors under this law the owner or owners of each boat shall make a monthly report to him of all vessels inspected by persons attached to said pilot boats the names of such vessels the owner or owners thereof and the places where owned or licensed and where trading to or from and the business in which they were engaged together with a list of their crews any inspector failing to make his report to the chief inspector shall pay a fine of twenty dollars for each such failure which fine shall be recovered by warrant before a justice of the county or corporation the chief inspector may direct the time and station for the crews of each pilot boat and may perform such other duty as the governor may designate not inconsistent with the other provisions of this act he shall make a quarterly return to the executive of all the transactions of his department reporting to him any failure or refusal on the part of inspectors to discharge the duty assigned to them and the governor for sufficient cause may suspend or remove from office any delinquent inspector the chief inspector shall receive as his compensation ten per cent on all the fees and fines received by the inspectors acting under his authority and may be removed at the pleasure of the executive sixteen all fees and forfeitures imposed by this act and not otherwise specially provided for shall go one half to the informer and the other be paid into the treasury of the state to constitute a fund to be called the fugitive slave fund and to be used for the payment of rewards awarded by the governor for the apprehension of runaway slaves and to pay other expenses incident to the execution of this law together with such other purposes as may hereafter be determined on by the general assembly seventeen this act shall be in force from its passage 
End of section 33. Recording by Greg Giordano, Newport Ritchie, Florida. Section 34 of The Underground Railroad, Part 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by L. D. Hamilton. The Underground Railroad, Part 2, by William Still. Section 34. Escaping in a Chest. $150 Reward. Ran away from the subscriber on Sunday night, 27th instant. My Negro Girl, Lear Green, about 18 years of age, black complexion, round featured, good looking and ordinary size. She had on and with her when she left a tan colored silk bonnet, a dark plaid silk dress, a light muslin delaine also one watered silk cape and one tan-colored cape. I have reason to be confident that she was persuaded off by a negro man named William Adams, black, quick-spoken, five feet ten inches high, a large scar on one side of his face, running down in a ridge by the corner of his mouth, about four inches long, barber by trade, but works mostly about taverns, opening oysters, etc. He has been missing about a week. He had been heard to say he was going to marry the above girl and ship to New York, where it is said his mother resides. The above reward will be paid if said girl is taken out of the state of Maryland and delivered to me or fifty dollars if taken in the state of maryland james noble m twenty six dash three t number one fifty three broadway baltimore lear green so particularly advertised in the baltimore sun by james noble won for herself a strong claim to a high place among the heroic women of the nineteenth century in regard to description and age the advertisement is tolerably accurate although her master might have added that her countenance was one of peculiar modesty and grace instead of being black she was of a dark brown color of her bondage she made the following statement she was owned by james noble a butter dealer of baltimore he fell heir to lear by the will of his wife's mother mrs rachel howard by whom she had previously been owned lear was but a mere child when she came into the hands of noble's family she therefore remembered but little of her old mistress her young mistress however had made a lasting impression upon her mind for she was very exacting and oppressive in regard to the tasks she was daily in the habit of laying upon lear's shoulders with no disposition whatever to allow her any liberties at least lear was never indulged in this respect in this situation a young man by the name of william adams proposed marriage to her this offer she was inclined to accept, but disliked the idea of being encumbered with the chains of slavery and the duties of a family at the same time. After a full consultation with her mother, and also her intended upon the matter, she decided that she must be free in order to fill the station of a wife and mother. For a time, dangers and difficulties in the way of escape seemed utterly to set at defiance all hope of success whilst every pulse was beating strong for liberty only one chance seemed to be left the trial of which required as much courage as it would to endure the cutting off the right arm or plucking out the right eye an old chest of substantial make such as sailors commonly use was procured 
a quilt, a pillow, and a few articles of raiment, with a small quantity of food and a bottle of water were put in it, and Lear placed therein. Strong ropes were fastened around the chest, and she was safely stowed amongst the ordinary freight on one of the Ericsson line of steamers. Her intended's mother, who was a free woman, agreed to come as a passenger on the same boat. How could she refuse? The prescribed rules of the company assigned colored passengers to the deck. In this instance, it was exactly where this guardian and mother desired to be, as near the chest as possible. Once or twice during the silent watches of the night, she was drawn irresistibly to the chest, and could not refrain from venturing to untie the rope and raise the lid a little to see if the poor child still lived, and at the same time to give her a breath of fresh air. Without uttering a whisper, that frightful moment, this office was successfully performed. That the silent prayers of this oppressed young woman, together with her faithful protectors, were momentarily ascending to the ear of the good God above, there can be no question. Nor is it to be doubted for a moment that some ministering angel aided the mother to unfasten the rope, and at the same time nerved the heart of poor Lear to endure the trying ordeal of her perilous situation. She declared that she had no fear. After she had passed eighteen hours in the chest, the steamer arrived at the wharf in Philadelphia, and in due time the living freight was brought off the boat, and at first was delivered at a house in Barley Street, occupied by particular friends of the mother. Subsequently, chest and freight were removed to the residence of the writer, in whose family she remained several days under the protection and care of the Vigilance Committee. Such hungering and thirsting for liberty as was evinced by Lear Green made the efforts of the most ardent friends who were in the habit of aiding fugitives seem feeble in the extreme. Of all the heroes in Canada or out of it who had purchased their liberty by downright bravery through perils the most hazardous, none deserve more praise than Lear Green. She remained for a time in this family and was then forwarded to Elmira. In this place she was married to William Adams, who has been previously alluded to. They never went to Canada, but took up their permanent abode in Elmira. The brief space of about three years only was allotted her in which to enjoy freedom, as death came and terminated her career. About the time of this sad occurrence, her mother-in-law died in this city. The impressions made by both mother and daughter can never be effaced. The chest in which Lear escaped has been preserved by the writer as a rare trophy, and her photograph taken, while in the chest, is an excellent likeness of her, and at the same time a fitting memorial. Isaac Williams, Henry Banks, and Kit Nicholas. Months in a Cave, Shot by Slave Hunters. Rarely were three travelers from the house of bondage received at the Philadelphia station, whose narratives were more interesting than those of the above-named individuals. Before escaping, they had encountered difficulties of the most trying nature, no better material for dramatic effect could be found than might have been gathered from the incidents of their lives and travels. But all that we can venture to introduce here is the brief account recorded at the time of their sojourn at the Philadelphia station when on their way to Canada in 1854. The three journeyed together. They had been slaves together in the same neighborhood. Two of them had shared the same den and cave in the woods, and had been shot, captured, and confined in the same prison, had broken out of prison, and again escaped. Consequently, their hearts were thoroughly cemented 
in the hope of reaching freedom together. Isaac was a stout-made young man, about twenty-six years of age, possessing a good degree of physical and mental ability. Indeed, his intelligence forbade his submission to the requirements of slavery, rendering him unhappy and led him to seek his freedom. He owed services to D. Fitzhugh up to within a short time before he escaped. Against Fitzhugh he made grave charges, said that he was a hard, bad man. It is but fair to add that Isaac was similarly regarded by his master, so both were dissatisfied with each other. But the master had the advantage of Isaac. He could sell him. Isaac, however, could turn the table on his master by running off. But the master moved quickly and sold Isaac to Dr. James, a Negro trader. The trader designed making a good speculation out of his investment. Isaac determined that he should be disappointed, indeed that he should lose every dollar that he paid for him. So while the doctor was planning where and how he could get the best price for him, Isaac was planning how and where he might safely get beyond his reach. The time for planning and acting with Isaac was, however, exceedingly short. He was daily expecting to be called upon to take his departure for the South. In this situation he made known his condition to a friend of his who was in a precisely similar situation, had lately been sold just as Isaac had to the same trader, James. So no argument was needed to convince his friend and fellow servant that if they meant to be free, they would have to set off immediately. That night, Henry Banks and Isaac Williams started for the woods together, preferring to live among reptiles and wild animals rather than be any longer at the disposal of Dr. James. For two weeks, they successfully escaped their pursuers. The woods, however, were being hunted in every direction, and one day the pursuers came upon them, shot them both, and carried them to King George's County Jail. The jail being an old building had weak places in it, but the prisoners concluded to make no attempt to break out while suffering badly from their wounds, so they remained one month in confinement. All the while their brave spirits under suffering grew more and more daring. Again they decided to strike for freedom. But where to go? Save to the woods, they had not the slightest idea. Of course, they had heard, as most slaves had, of cave life, and pretty well understood all the measures which had to be resorted to for security when entering upon so hazardous an undertaking. They concluded, however, that they could not make their condition any worse, let circumstances be what they might in this respect. Having discovered how they could break jail, they were not long in accomplishing their purpose, and were out and off to the woods again. This time they went far into the forest, and there they dug a cave, and with great pains had everything so completely arranged as to conceal the spot entirely. In this den they stayed three months. Now and then they would manage to secure a pig. A friend also would occasionally serve them with a meal. Their sufferings at best were fearful, but great as they were, the thought of returning to slavery never occurred to them, and the longer they stayed in the woods, the greater was their determination to be free. In the belief that their owner had about given them up, they resolved to take the North Star for a pilot and try in this way to reach free land. Kit, an old friend in time of need, having proved true to them in their cave, was consulted. He fully appreciated their heroism and determined that he would join them in the undertaking as he was badly treated by his master, who was called General Washington, a common farmer 
hard drinker, and brutal fighter, which Kit's poor back fully evinced by the marks it bore. Of course, Isaac and Henry were only too willing to have him accompany them. In leaving their respective homes, they broke kindred ties of the tenderest nature. Isaac had a wife, Eliza, and three children, Isaac, Estella, and Ellen, all owned by Fitzhugh. Henry was only nineteen, single, but left parents, brothers, and sisters, all owned by different slaveholders. Kit had a wife, Matilda, and three children, Sarah Ann, Jane Frances, and Ellen, slaves. Arrival of Five from the Eastern Shore of Maryland, September 28, 1856 Cyrus Mitchell, alias John Steele, Joshua Handy, alias Hambleton Hamby, Charles Dutton, alias William Robinson, Ephraim Hudson, alias John Spry, Francis Moloch, alias Thomas Jackson, all in good order and full of hope. The following letter from the fearless friend of the slave Thomas Garrett is a specimen of his manner of dispatching underground railroad business. He used Uncle Sam's mail and his own name with as much freedom as though he had been president of the Pennsylvania Central Railroad instead of only a conductor and stockholder on the Underground Railroad. Ninth month, 26th, 1856. Respected friend, William Still, I send to thy care this evening by railroad five able-bodied men on their way north, receiving them as the good Samaritan of old, and oblige thy friend, Thomas Garrett. The able-bodied men duly arrived, and were thus recorded on the Underground Railroad books as trophies of the success of the Friends of Humanity. Cyrus is twenty-six years of age, stout and unmistakably dark, and was owned by James K. Lewis, a storekeeper, and a hard master. He kept slaves for the express purpose of hiring them out, and it seemed to afford him as much pleasure to receive the hard-earned dollars of his bondsmen as if he had labored for them with his own hands. It mattered not how mean a man might be, if he would pay the largest price. He was the man whom the storekeeper preferred to hire to. This always caused Cyrus to dislike him. Latterly, he had been talking of moving into the state of Virginia. Cyrus disliked this talk exceedingly, but he said nothing to the white people, touching the matter. However, he was not long in deciding that such a move would be of no advantage to him. Indeed, he had an idea, if all was true, that he had heard about that place. He would still be more miserable there than he had ever been under his present owner. At once, he decided that he would move towards Canada, and that he would be fixed in his new home before his master got off to Virginia, unless he moved sooner than Cyrus expected him to do. Those nearest of kin to whom he felt most tenderly allied, and from whom he felt that it would be hard to part, were his father and mother. He, however, decided that he should have to leave them. Freedom, he felt, was even worth the giving up of parents. Believing that company was desirable, he took occasion to submit his plan to certain friends who were at once pleased with the idea of a trip on the Underground Railroad, to Canada, etc., and all agreed to join him. At first they traveled on foot. Of their subsequent travel, mention has already been made in Friend Garrett's epistle. Joshua is about twenty-seven years of age, quite stout, brown color, and would pass for an intelligent farmhand. 
He was satisfied never to wear the yoke again that someone else might reap the benefit of his toil. His master, Isaac Harris, he denounced as a drunkard. His chief excuse for escaping was because Harris had sold his only brother. He was obliged to leave his father and mother in the hands of his master. Charles is twenty-two years of age, also stout and well-made, and apparently possessed all the qualifications for doing a good day's work on a farm. He was held to service by Mrs. Mary Hurley. Charles gave no glowing account of happiness and comfort under the rule of the female sex. Indeed, he was positive in saying that he had been used rough. During the present year, he was sold for $1,200. Ephraim is 22 years of age, stout and athletic, one who appears in every way fitted for manual labor or anything else that he might be privileged to learn. John Campbell Henry was the name of the man whom he had been taught to address as master and for whose benefit he had been compelled to labor up to the day he took out. In consideration what he had been in Maryland and how he had been treated all his life, he alleged that John Campbell Henry was a bad man. Not only had Ephraim been treated badly by his master, but he had been hired out to a man no better than his master, if as good. Ephraim left his mother and six brothers and sisters. Francis is twenty-one, an able-bodied article, of dark color, and was owned by James A. Waddell. All that he could say of his owner was that he was a hard master, from whom he was very glad to escape. End of section 34 Recording by L. D. Hamilton Section 35 of the Underground Railroad Part 2 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Maria Casper The Underground Railroad, Part 2, by William Still Section 35 Sundry Arrivals About August 1, 1855 Arrival 1st, Francis Hilliard Arrival 2nd, Louisa Harding, alias Rebecca Hall Arrival 3rd, John McIntosh Arrival 4th, Maria Jane Houston Arrival 5th, Miles Hoops Arrival 6th, Samuel Miles, alias Robert King Arrival 7th, James Henson, alias David Caldwell Arrival 8th, Laura Lewis Arrival 9th, Elizabeth Banks Arrival 10th, Simon Hill Arrival 11th, Anthony and Albert Brown Arrival 12th, George Williams and Charles Holliday Arrival 13th, William Govan While none in this catalogue belong to the class whose daring adventures rendered their narratives marvellous, Nevertheless, they represented a very large number of those who were continually on the alert to get rid of their captivity, and in all their efforts in this direction they manifested a marked willingness to encounter perils, either by land or water, by day or by night, to obtain their God-given rights. Doubtless, even among these names will be found those who have been supposed to be lost, and mysteries will be disclosed which have puzzled scores of relatives longing and looking many years in vain to ascertain the whereabouts of this or that companion, brother, sister, or friend. So if impelled by no other consideration than the hope of consoling this class of anxious inquirers, 
This is a sufficient justification for not omitting them entirely, notwithstanding the risk of seeming to render these pages monotonous. Arrival number one. First on this record was a young mulatto woman, twenty-nine years of age, orange color, who could read and write very well, and was unusually intelligent, and withal quite handsome. She was known by the name of Frances Hilliard, and escaped from Richmond, Virginia, where she was owned by Beverly Blair. The owner hired her out to a man by the name of Green, from whom he received seventy dollars per annum. Green allowed her to hire herself for the same amount, with the understanding that Frances should find all her own clothes, board herself, and find her own house to live in. Her husband, who was also a slave, had fled nearly one year previous, leaving her widowed, of course. Notwithstanding the above-mentioned conditions under which she had the privilege of living, Frances said that she had been used well. She had been sold four times in her life. In the first instance, the failure of her master was given as the reason of her sale. Subsequently, she was purchased and sold by different traders, who designed to speculate upon her as a fancy article. They would dress her very elegantly, in order to show her off to the best advantage possible. But it appears that she had too much regard for her husband and her honor to consent to fill the positions which had been basely assigned her by her owners. Frances assisted her husband to escape from his owner, Tate's, and was never contented until she succeeded in following him to Canada. In escaping, she left her mother, Sarah Corbin, and her sister, Maria. On reaching the Vigilance Committee, she learned all about her husband. She was conveyed from Richmond, secreted on a steamer, under the care of one of the colored hands on the boat. From here she was forwarded to Canada at the expense of the committee. Arriving in Toronto, and not finding her hopes fully realized with regard to meeting her husband, she wrote back the following letter. Toronto, Canada, U.C., October 15, 1855. My dear Mr. Still, Sir, I take the opportunity of writing you a few lines to inform you of my health. I am very well at present, and hope that when these few lines reach you they may find you enjoying the same blessing. Give my love to Mrs. Still and all the children, and also to Mr. Swan, and tell him that he must give you the money that he has, and you will please send it to me, as I have received a letter from my husband, saying that I must come on to him as soon as I get the money from him. I cannot go to him until I get the money that Mr. Swan has in hand. Please tell Mr. Cossel that the clothes he spoke of, my mother did not know anything about them. I left them with Hinson Brown, and he promised to give them to Mr. Smith. Tell him to ask Mr. Smith to get them from Mr. Brown for me, and when I get settled I will send him word, and he can send them to me. The letters that were sent to me, I received them all. I wish you would send me word if Mr. Smith is on the boat yet. If he is, please write me word in your next letter. Please send me the money as soon as you possibly can, for I am very anxious to see my husband. I send to you, for I think you will do what you can for me. No more at present, but remain yours truly, Francis Hilliard. Send me word if Mr. Cossel had given Mr. Smith the money that he promised to give him. For one who had to steal the art of reading and writing, her letter bears studying. Arrival number two. Louisa Harding, alias Rebecca Hall. Louisa was a mulatto girl, seventeen years of age. She reported herself from Baltimore, where she had been owned by lawyer McGill. It might be said that she also possessed great personal attractions as an article of much value in the eye of a trader. All the near kin whom she named as having left behind consisted of a mother and a brother. Arrival number three, John McIntosh. John's history is short. He represented himself as having arrived from Darien, Georgia, where he had seen hard times. Age forty-four. 
This is all that was recorded of John, except the expenses met by the committee. Arrival number four. Maria Jane Houston. The little state of Delaware lost in the person of Maria, one of her nicest-looking bondmaids. She had just arrived at the age of twenty-one, and felt that she had already been sufficiently wronged. She was a tall, dark young woman from the neighborhood of Cantwell's Bridge. Although she had no horrible tales of suffering to relate, the committee regarded her as well worthy of aid. Arrival number five, Miles Hooper. This subject came from North Carolina. He was owned by George Montague, who lived at Federal Mills, was a decided opponent to the no-pay system, to flogging and selling likewise. In fact, nothing that was auxiliary to slavery was relished by him. Consequently, he concluded to leave the place altogether. At the time that Miles took this stand, he was twenty-three years of age, a dark-complexioned man, rather under the medium height physically, but a full-grown man mentally. My owner was a hard man, said Miles, in speaking of his characteristics. His parents, brothers, and sisters were living, at least he had reason to believe so, although they were widely scattered. Arrival number 6, Samuel Miles, alias Robert King. Samuel was a representative of Revel's Neck, Somerset County, Maryland. His master he regarded as a very fractious man, hard to please. The cause of the trouble or unpleasantness which resulted in Samuel's underground adventure was traceable to his master's refusal to allow him to visit his wife. Not only was Samuel denied this privilege, but he was equally denied all privileges. His master probably thought that Sam had no mind, nor any need of a wife. Whether this was really so or not, Sam was shrewd enough to leave his old master with the bag to hold, which was sensible. Thirty-one years of Samuel's life were passed in slavery ere he escaped. The remainder of his days he felt bound to have the benefit of himself. In leaving home he had to part with his wife and one child, Sarah and little Henry, who were fortunately free. On arriving in Canada, Samuel wrote back for his wife, etc., as follows. St. Catharines, C.W., August twentieth, 1855. To Mr. William Still, Dear friend, it gives me pleasure to inform you that I have had the good fortune to reach this northern Canaan, I got here yesterday, and am in good health, and happy in the enjoyment of freedom, but am very anxious to have my wife and child here with me. I wish you to write to her immediately on receiving this, and let her know where I am. You will recollect her name, Sarah Miles, at Baltimore, on the corner of Hamburg and Utah Streets. Please encourage her in making a start, and give her the necessary directions how to come. She will please to make the time as short as possible in getting through to Canada. Say to my wife that I wish her to write immediately to the friends that I told her to address as soon as she hears from me. Inform her that I now stop in St. Catharines near the Niagara Falls, that I am not yet in business but expect to get into business very soon, that I am in the enjoyment of good health and hoping that this communication may find my affectionate wife the same that I have been highly favored with friends throughout my journey. I wish my wife to write to me as soon as she can, and let me know how soon I may expect to see her on this side of the Niagara River. My wife had better call on Dr. Perkins, and perhaps he will let her have the money he had in charge for me, but that I failed of receiving when I left Baltimore. Please direct the letter for my wife to Mr. George Lister, in Hill Street, between Howard and Sharp. My compliments to all inquiring friends. Very respectfully yours, Samuel Miles. P.S. Please send the thread along as a token, and my wife will understand that all is right. S.M. Arrival number 7. James Henson, alias David Caldwell. James fled from Cecil County, Maryland. He claimed that he was entitled to his freedom, according to law, 
at the age of twenty-eight, but had been unjustly deprived of it. Having waited in vain for his free papers for four years, he suspected that he was to be dealt with in a manner similar to many others, who had been willed free, or who had bought their time, and had been shamefully cheated out of their freedom. So in his judgment he felt that his only hope lay in making his escape on the Underground Railroad. He had no faith whatever in the man who held him in bondage, Jacob Johnson, but no other charges of ill-treatment, etc., have been found against said Johnson on the books, save those alluded to above. James was thirty-two years of age, stout and well-proportioned, with more than average intelligence and resolution. He left a wife and child, both free. Arrival number 8. Laura Lewis. Laura arrived from Louisville, Kentucky. She had been owned by a widow woman named Lewis, but as lately as the previous March her mistress died, leaving her slaves and other property to be divided among her heirs. As this would necessitate a sale of the slaves, Laura determined not to be on hand when the selling day came, so she took time by the forelock and left. Her appearance indicated that she had been among the more favored class of slaves. She was about twenty-five years of age, quite stout, of mixed blood and intelligent, having traveled considerably with her mistress. She had been north in this capacity. She left her mother, one brother, and one sister in Louisville. Arrival number nine, Elizabeth Banks, from near Easton, Maryland. Her lot had been that of an ordinary slave. Of her slave life, nothing of interest was recorded. She had escaped from her owner two and a half years prior to coming into the hands of the committee, and had been living in Pennsylvania pretty securely, as she had supposed but she had been awakened to a sense of her danger by well-grounded reports that she was pursued by her claimant, and would be likely to be captured if she tarried short of Canada. With such facts staring her in the face, she was sent to the committee for counsel and protection, and by them she was forwarded on in the usual way. She was about twenty-five years of age, of a dark and spare structure. Arrival number 10, Simon Hill this fugitive had escaped from Virginia. The usual examination was made, and needed help given him by the committee, who felt satisfied that he was a poor brother who had been shamefully wronged, and that he richly deserved sympathy. He was aided and directed Canada Ward. He was a very humble-looking specimen of the peculiar institution, about twenty-five years of age, medium size, and of a dark hue. Arrival number 11, Anthony and Albert Brown, brothers, Jones, Anderson, and Isaiah. This party escaped from Tanner's Creek, Norfolk, Virginia, where they had been owned by John and Henry Holland, oystermen. As slaves, they alleged that they had been subjected to very brutal treatment from their profane and ill-natured owners. Not relishing this treatment, Albert and Anthony came to the conclusion that they understood boating well enough to escape by water. They accordingly selected one of their master's small oyster boats, which was pretty well rigged with sails, and off they started for a northern shore. They proceeded on a part of their voyage merely by guesswork, but landed safely, however, about twenty-five miles north of Baltimore, though by no means on free soil. They had no knowledge of the danger that they were then in, but they were persevering and still determined to make their way north, and thus at last success attended their efforts. Their struggles and exertions having been attended with more of the romantic and tragical elements than had characterized the undertakings of any of the other late passengers, the committee felt inclined to make a fuller notice of them on the book yet failed to do them justice in this respect. The elder brother was twenty-nine, the younger twenty-seven. Both were mentally above the average run of slaves. They left wives in Norfolk, named Alexenia and Ellen. 
while Anthony and Albert, in seeking their freedom, were forced to sever their connections with their companions, they did not forget them in Canada. How great was their delight in freedom, and tender their regard for their wives, and the deep interest they felt for their brethren and friends generally, may be seen from a perusal of the following letters from them. Hamilton, March 7, 1856. Mr. William Still, Sir, I now take the opportunity of writing you a few lines, hoping to find yourself and family well, as these lines leaves me at present, myself and brother, Anthony and Albert Brown's respects. We have spent quite agreeable winter. We were employed in the new hotel, name Anglo-American, where we wintered and done very well. We also met with our two friends who came from home with us, Jonas Anderson and Isaias. Now we are all safe in Hamilton, I wish to call you to your promise, if convenient, to write to Norfolk, Virginia for me, and let my wife Mary Ellen Brown know where I am, and my brother's wife, Alexina Brown, as we have never heard a word from them since we left. Tell them that we found our homes and situation in Canada much better than we expected. Tell them not to think hard of us. We was bound to flee from the wrath to come. Tell them we live in the hopes of meeting them once more this side of the grave. Tell them, if we never more see them, we hope to meet them in the kingdom of heaven in peace. Tell them to remember my love to my church and brethren. Tell them I find there is the same prayer-hearing God here as there is in old Virginia. Tell them to remember our love to all the inquiring friends. I have written several times, but have never received no answer. I find a great many of my old acquaintance from Virginia. Here we are no ways lonesome. Mr. Still, I have written to you once before, but received no answer. Please let us hear from you, by any means. Nothing more at present, but remain your friends, Anthony and Albert Brown. Hamilton, June 26, 1856. Mr. William Still. Kind sir, I am happy to say to you that I have just received my letter, dated 5th of the present month but previously had been informed last night by Mr. J. H. Hall. He had just received a letter from you stating that my wife was with you. Oh, my! I was so glad it caused me to shed tears. Mr. Still, I cannot return you the thanks for the care of my wife, for I am so glad that I don't know what to say. You will please start her for Canada. I am yet in Hamilton, C.W., at the City Hotel. My brother and Joseph Anderson is at the Anglo-American Hotel. They send their respects to you and family, myself also, and a greater part to my wife. I came by way of Syracuse. Remember me to Mrs. Loggins. Tell her to write back to my brother's wife if she is living, and tell her to come on. Tell her to send Joseph Anderson's love to his mother. I now send her ten dollars and would send more, but being out of employment some of winter, it pulls me back. You will be so kind as to forward her on to me, and if life lasts I will satisfy you at some time before long. Give my respects and brothers to Mr. John Dennis. Tell him Mr. Hill's family as well, and send their love to him. I now bring my letter to a close, and am your most humble servant, Anthony Brown. P.S. I had given out the notion of ever seeing my wife again, so I have not been attending the office, but am truly sorry I did not. You mention in yours of Mr. Henry Louis. He has left this city for Boston about two weeks ago. We have not heard from him yet. A. Brown Arrival number 12. George Williams and Charles Holliday These two travelers were about the same age. They were not, however, from the same neighborhood. They happened to meet each other as they were traveling the road. George fled from St. Louis, Charles from Baltimore. George owed service to Isaac Hill, a planter. He found no special fault with his master's treatment of him, but with Mrs. Hill touching this point he was thoroughly dissatisfied. She had treated him cruelly, and it was for this reason that he was moved to seek his freedom. Charles, being a Baltimorean, had not far to travel, but had pretty sharp hunters to elude. 
His claimant, F. Smith, however, had only a term of years claim upon him, which was within about two years of being out. This contract for the term of years Charles felt was made without consulting him, therefore he resolved to break it without consulting his master. He also declined to have anything to do with the Baltimore and Wilmington Railroad Company, considering it a prescriptive institution not worthy of his confidence. He started on a fast walk, keeping his eyes wide open, looking out for slave hunters on his right and left. In this way, like many others, he reached the committee safely, and was freely aided, thenceforth traveling in a first-class underground railroad car till he reached his journey's end. Arrival number 13. William Govan. Availing himself of a passage on the schooner of Captain B., William left Petersburg, where he had been owned by a Mark Davis Esquire, a retired gentleman, rather a retired negro trader william was about thirty-three years of age and was of a bright orange color nothing but an ardent love of liberty prompted him to escape he was quite smart and a clever-looking man worth at least a thousand dollars end of section thirty five end of the underground railroad part two by william still